So thanks everyone for joining us. I just wanted to introduce uh, Dr. Hadi Lisha from uh, Tennessee. Uh, now he is uh, proudly NBPS, NBPAS certified. <laughs> Uh, very proud of that. This is, uh, I hope all of you would follow. Main, maintain, main, not maintaining certification. <laughs> right. <laughs> Proudly not maintaining. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I thought I would present kind of some unusual cases today and um, mostly kind of the use of intravascular lithotripsy in the acute setting. So. Okay, so this is a, a middle-aged gentleman uh, without known coronary disease, uh, actually smoker, presented with an inferior STEMI, typical presentation of inferior STEMI. And uh, obviously, in my kind of practice, I like to look at the left main before I start working on the right, if this is a right coronary culprit. But uh, I don't know about you, Arvin, do you have a different uh, approach of the contralateral coronary if it's anterior STEMI versus inferior STEMI? Yeah, I like to shoot the non-culprit side first, just so I have an idea. And then, um, uh, you know, if they're sick, I'll actually dip the LV first. That's kind of the first thing I like to do if someone comes in hypotensive. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, the only time where I look at the contralateral is when if it's inferior. When it's anterior, I usually go after the, the, the culprit because it's not going to change my management that much. But a 99% left main is going to change my management of an inferior STEMI. So, uh, so obviously, you can see lesions, uh, severe lesions, moderately calcified lesions in the LAD and in the obtuse marginal. Uh, the obtuse marginal stenosis is moderate, but the LAD stenosis is pretty tight. So we already kind of having in mind in case of hemodynamic instability, which had not occurred yet, and he was electrically stable. Uh, this is the LAD uh, with uh, the disease and diagonal branches also. So obviously we move on quick to the culprit uh, vessel. Uh, and this is, by the way, an Icari 6 French 4. Uh, I like those. In, uh, in STEMIs, uh, the radial approach, uh, universal guides. I know they're not very supportive for the left coronary, but they're very supportive for the right. Believe it or not, um, it's almost as supportive as an AL1 if you uh, really lean on the contralateral sinus. So I kind of- Do you do all your STEMIs with this guide? I try to. And of course, you know, if there are any anatomical, you know, someone that doesn't fit the usual mold, I kind of try to, uh, go with a guide that, that, you know, where I expect the lesion to be. So an EBU or which is a six French EBU 375 is my go-to and most average sized people. If it's left-sided, if it's right-sided, I like the 3D right guide. But uh, if you ask me a universal guide, I think the Icaris have really worked well for me. Uh, and of course, on the left side, if I have to use, uh, you know, I, I have a low threshold to use a guide extension. So that kind of solves and gets me five minutes on my door to balloon time. Uh, so, um, so obviously, this is an unusual kind of lesion that we see in STEMI. We, you know, as you and I were talking before, this is not the typical plaque rupture with, uh, you know, necrotic core and obviously the direct stenting kind of lesion. You see obviously a coral reef worth of calcium, uh, either a plaque erosion and or a calcified nodule. We cannot 100% confirm that because uh, the only intravascular imaging that I have available is IVIS. I don't have OCT and IVIS would not cross as you can imagine. And on top of that, there's obviously a filling defect in the small little island that opacifies um, right after, which could be most likely organized thrombus, but also could be uh, some calcified component, but obviously it re-occludes. And uh, the challenge here is obviously if you go with your, where usual uh, aspiration thrombectomy, mechanical thrombectomy or balloon angioplasty, this is not the kind of lesion that responds to usual therapy. Um, I feel like a lot more of my STEMIs are more like this than the straightforward, just quick balloon stand, get out of there. That's right. I mean, and uh, with the aging, uh, aging patient population, the renal insufficiency, um, it's unbelievable how much of this is being seen in the acute setting, more in the non-STEMI than STEMI. But 
I've been seeing, at least I would say in my own personal experience, at least 30, 40% of my STEMIs have a significant calcified component, uh, not the usual bread and butter kind of lesion. So the thought process here was for me to just, um, I wanted to really aspirate that big clot in the middle. And of course my CAT-RX would not have crossed this proximal calcification. So I thought I would just pre-dilate with a, uh, uh, this is a 275 NC balloon just so I can get a, a channel going for the CAT-RX to pass. And um, of course, um, the CAT-RX, you can imagine uh, the difficulties in delivering that. There was a big calcified nodule there and the thrombus is laying right after that. So instead of fighting and all of that, you can see the, the guides are obviously not too happy. Uh, I let the cataract sit there for like a minute and it was all foaming through the tubing and uh, just whatever I can aspirate through that small little channel that I have there. Are you uh, routinely kind of letting it sit for 30 seconds? Yeah, so I was, uh, you know, and from trial and error, I noticed that if you give it 30 extra seconds, it's unbelievable how much more effective it is. And it's not like two minutes more, it's 30 seconds. And So even oh, if it's plugged, you go for a minute? Even if it's... Even if it's like plugged, you don't see any uh, anything coming out the back end? Yes, correct. Absolutely. I actually, this is where I love to sit on it. And this is when it's going to take its time to reach my tubing, etc., uh, that kind of encouraged me to slow down, actually, rather than kind of get out. And uh, went back and looked at the cheetah uh, data, the trial on CAT-RX uh, that really pushed it forward uh, a couple of years ago. And the average uh, pass time was 69 seconds. It wasn't 10 seconds. It wasn't 15. It was 69 seconds. So all these operators to get grade 3 blush and all these great clinical outcomes. They, they let it sit for a minute most of the time. Uh, so I, and it's obviously a good investment. Um, it saves you a lot of time for the rest of the case. So here we aspirated some of the clot, but of course there is a small residual in that area. And now we're dealing with a coral reef kind of um, lesion. And uh, that's not the typical STEMI situation. So let's kind of, kind of open it up to you, Arvin. What do you think options are available for that in this kind of setting? I mean, one is is take your imaging catheter down. If it doinks, you know it's calcified and it's tight. So then it needs some kind of modification. I think in in the ACS setting, I hate doing uh, rota because of all the uh, you know stunning of the microvasculature. So you know, I'd probably looking at it. I think I'll go guideliner up front um, uh, with plans of. Uh, of, of trying to deliver the shockwave. If I can, I'll take a, just a compliant balloon, try to deliver that as far down as I can, getting my, my guide extension catheter as far down the vessel, then un, unsheathing my uh, my IVL balloon to kind of kind of do that. And I'll, I'll probably go at least one-to-one -one on this on this vessel um, based on whatever the IVIS would show me. So even if it does doink off the calcium, I get some valuable information. Yeah, excellent. I mean, obviously, you know, we think alike and the, the challenge here is the combination of organized thrombus and calcium. So technically, the only two available technologies that we can use is either laser, which is great for thrombus, but not the best for more than moderate calcium. And for sure, we have more than moderate calcium here. You can see the two sides even without a contrast. Uh, and the fact that the IVIS caster did not cross. And the second technology is obviously intravascular lithotripsy shockwave, uh, which has a, a huge benefit with regards to distal embolization. Um, the only downside, obviously, in someone who is hemodynamically unstable or throwing VTs or conduction abnormalities is the length, the duration of the angioplasty time, which obviously um, may be a problem. But in a STEMI situation, the vessel was already occluded. So, uh, Heidi, one thing I really like, I'm just looking at your RCA. I kind of think of this as the cath lab tapsy because the RCA runs in the AV groove. It looks like there's a lot of good motion there. So it doesn't look like RV failure just off of this. That's right. That's a very good observation, uh, which is Obviously, uh, because this lesion is chronic and it was, was probably 99% before it occluded, 
I bet uh, there were, and on the left charts, you can see some very faint collateralization. Uh, so maybe this uh, patient is counting on that from the chronicity of the lesion. So obviously we, we wanted to get the shock wave to go, but as you can see here with this uh, 95, 99%, uh, I wouldn't expect a shockwave balloon to go through even with a six French uh, guide extension. So obviously predilation uh, with an undersized non-compliant balloon. Uh, this is, a, I think, a 3.0 non-compliant uh, just to get some channel going. And of course, we noticed the distal lesion, which was treated at that time. And uh, at this point, before we wanted to get the shockwave down, thought maybe now IVIS can cross. And again, it, it would not cross. You can tell even with uh, Lumen available with all the irregularities and all of us uh, experience that in daily practice. So unfortunately, we couldn't get really some nice images before shockwave, but I'm gonna show you a little bit later after shockwave. And, uh, as you see, the uh, six French guideliner was um, very effective in allowing us to get the 4.0, uh, 12 shockwave through, and this is one of the first few inflations. Um, I usually like to start at two, and I think at this point we went up to four atmospheres and starting to yield, but of course it's not the atmospheric pressure, it's the pulses. That's probably halfway through the 120 pulses. I was pretty pleased with the um, expansion. Of course, we treated the distal lesion first, uh, stented that, and it wasn't that calcified. And um, this is uh, where we uh, positioned a 3538 uh, Zions. Um, obviously, the landing zone, I wasn't too sure about, but I thought I would give it a try with one stent instead of two stents. Um, and uh, the expansion was pretty good. Uh, and of course, this was uh, post dilated with a 4.0 non-compliant balloon, uh, distal mid, and 4.5 non-compliant balloon in the proximal segment. Um, and I did IVIS, I think, right after that, and I'll show you um, these images a little bit later. It's, it's crazy how imaging changes our NC balloon size. In 10 but years ago, you would never see a 4.5 NC in a calcified lesion. 100%. You're so right. Like, I wouldn't, you know, I would have been nervous to get a 3.5, 3.75 non compliant, honestly. But uh, it's even without looking at the images, all of us have been adding 0.25 to 0.5 to our visual estimation. So, um, and especially with, with such bad calcification. So I'm going to kind of forward a little through here to get you to the final result. So obviously this case, and you can see obviously there's a little distal embolization in the right posterior lateral, which we obviously, uh, at this point, we were not going to chase that. And hopefully with, he was not on antiplatelet therapy before he came in. So we were hoping this would take care of it. But um, the... Uh, Unique aspect of this case is obviously the acuteness. Um, more often we see this in non-STEMI than STEMI, but we're seeing more and more STEMI with these kinds of lesions, calcified nodules and plaque erosion. Um, and obviously shockwave is very, very helpful. Um, I know it, it's not something that has been extensively studied, but it's, uh, it's safe. It doesn't lead to uh, embolization and if the patient can tolerate those inflations, which most of the time they could in an occluded vessel, uh, I think it's a great option to think about in the acute setting. And Hadi, are you preloading these patients in the ER, on the table, Kangalore? What are you doing with these? Because this is a more complex case. Yeah, so uh, on this case, obviously he had Berlinta in the ED, but um, uh, this is obviously, you know, probably 20, 25 minutes into the... Actually, at this point, we had worked for a while, so... At this point, Brillanta should should be starting to work, but uh, most of the time uh, for STEMI, of course, we we go with P two Y twelve. What do you do? I actually do uh, quite a bit of Kangalore. <laughs> wow! I do I do it. I mean, it, you know, and then by the time the Brillanta administrators becomes, must love you. Uh, they do right, yeah. But <laughs> by by the time the bolus bag runs out, then then we just stop it. The, basically, gotcha. so so that's kind of our our workflow a little bit, and then. Um, 
Yeah. The other question I had for you is, how do you deal with the non-culprit lesions? Are you staging on the day of? Depends how complicated it is. Are you doing it on the same hospital admin or are you bringing back another day? So these are excellent questions and a lot of clinical judgment comes in. Uh, obviously, we know for the most recent data that we've seen published in the last two years that most of the time, in order to avoid um, kind of readmissions, we prefer to kind of take care of most of the non-culprit lesion in the first kind of six weeks of the presentation. Of course, nobody's going to stay at the hospital for six weeks, but depending on the clinical judgment, how much dye we've used, what's the patient's kidney function, um, how much uh, is this going to require mechanical support, etc. All these factors, the anatomical factors, the patient factors uh, that go into the decision, am I going to do this in a couple of days versus am I going to do this within two to three weeks, but never more than six weeks. We try to prioritize those patients. Uh, what have you been doing? Well, I, I think, again, like you said, it, it's a case-by-case -case basis, but there's been this urge since the COVID era and we had a lack of ICU beds that now people are like discharging STEMIs within 24 hours, which yeah. I still feel, I don't think it's crazy to keep a STEMI patient for 48 hours, watch them for arrhythmia right. and things like that. The first question I get is, do you want an ICU bed for a STEMI? That's the first question I get now. Right. I mean, it's, it's not like, it's like, oh, so yeah, send them to the ICU, let's watch them for 24 hours and send them out the next day. It's basically PCU and home over ICU, especially if they're not hypotensive. Um, that's really been our, our, our practice, but I still don't think it's wrong to keep a STEMI patient 48 hours. Right. <laughs> it's, um, you know, the pressure of length of stay, but um, I think honestly, both approaches are okay. As long as your clinical judgment thinks, uh, as long as you think it's relatively safe and most of those patients are going to go home and sit around and not do much. So uh, it's not a terrible idea to bring them back. But again, case by case, depending on the LV function, on the anatomical findings. So this is obviously the non-culprit lesion, the LAD, which um, uh, we're going to bring the patient back for. And of course, um, you know, there is also a role for hybrid revascularization with robotic lima to the LED. That's a whole different kind of topic, but prox LAD and a relatively young gentleman, I, I tried to bring this up uh, with the patient. Uh, what about you, Arvin? Yeah, same thing. There's always that discussion. Um, I think probably this one, you know, looks, yeah, there, there's some uh, diagonal branch disease with that. So, I mean, I probably would do PCI, but have a reasonable discussion with them. You said this patient's 50 years old. Uh, in the fifties, right? Mid fifties. So it's one. It's one of those things. I think have a frank discussion with the patient. Right. Okay. Cool. Perfect.